So uh, let me share with you uh, two quite interesting interfaith encounters that I have had this week. First of all, on Monday, I found, I found myself at Menorah Synagogue in Gatley for the festival of Simhat Torah, which um, a, a Jewish colleague of mine um, invited me along to the service. Uh, she had a very special part in the service, so it was lovely to go along and support her. Simhat Torah is that time of the year when, um, when the Jewish people finish the end of their annual cycle of readings and then they, they begin that, that cycle again within the same service. So if you remember, the, the books of Moses especially are important, the first five books of our Bible, um, Genesis to Deuteronomy. So what they do, they, they read the end of Deuteronomy and then they just carry on back into Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. And it's lovely. It's always beautiful to hear Genesis chapter 1, especially in the Hebrew. It's just so gorgeous and so rhythmic uh, and so beautiful. Um, but it was quite a service. Um, we started at half past 10. We were still going at half past 1. And uh, that was before the food arrived. <laughs> there was, it was a real celebration. I mean, there weren't it wasn't a huge congregation, probably about 30, 40 people. But uh, there, was, there was dancing. Um, there was halfway through, there was chocolate and whiskey uh, to keep us going, which is great. Um, and here we are today in, in our churches. Many, as I say, many churches today celebrating Bible Sunday. And it's a similar theme. We're celebrating the gift of the Holy Scriptures. As far as I'm aware... Uh, this service will be a lot shorter. It won't be three hours, don't worry. Uh, I'm not predicting any dancing. Feel free. And there won't be any chocolate or whiskey, I'm afraid. But I hope we can likewise celebrate and give thanks for that wonderful gift of the Holy Scriptures. In our first reading from Romans chapter 15, St. Paul talks about the encouragement of the Scriptures. The scriptures encourage us. Yes, at times they puzzle us. At times they baffle us. A lot of the time because they were written a long, long time ago. They were written in, in worlds that were, that were in many ways very, very different from our own. But above all, Paul says the scriptures are there to encourage us. It's the Bible that encourages us. It's the Bible that lifts our spirits. It's the Bible that puts fire into our belly. It's the belly, it's the Bible that spurs us into action. And why the Bible does this, I, I shall come on to. But first of all, I want to share my second uh, interfaith encounter of the week, which wasn't so positive, I must say. I had a visit from the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> now, they visited, as they always do, at a really inconvenient time, I was up to my elbows, literally, in household chores. And, uh, but they didn't seem to get the hint. <laughs> so I actually said, this is, this is not a very convenient time. Ah, OK. Well, we'll come back. When can we come and visit you? And they knew, they knew by then that I was the rector here. And I said, well, open church is always a good time. I'm, I'm always here in open church on the first Sunday of the month. That's, that's when people tend to come and chat to me about whatever. Um, but that wasn't good enough, you know, no, when can we come and talk to you in your home? Because that's what they do. That's what you do when you're a Jehovah's Witness. So knowing a little bit about their beliefs and having had conversations before, and their beliefs are basically that, that ever since the second century, uh, the mainstream church has been in error. I gently suggested that, that with my being an Anglican rector, um, I didn't see much point, really, to a conversation. Um, I, I'm, I'm all for having conversations with anyone, as long as there's an open agenda. But I, my experience is usually that with the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's not an open agenda. Um, there's this kind of feeling that they're right and you're wrong, and, and <laughs> not much room for negotiation. Anyway, I said, look, what's the point? I'm not going to change my position anytime soon. And I gently suggested, wouldn't they be better off maybe speaking to someone 
who doesn't believe in God at all. Um, but they said, oh no, the truth is important. Don't you want to know the truth? And they quoted from John's gospel. They quoted John uh, when Jesus said, uh, the truth shall set you free. And I said, ah, yes, but also in John's gospel, Jesus said, I am the truth. Well, that, that seemed to shut them up for a little bit. <laughs> and actually, they didn't stay for long um, after that. Whether they'll be back, who knows? Here's a little tip. The Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, they love talking about the Bible. They love talking about scripture. But I find they don't seem to like talking about Jesus so much. And that's because, and this is where I find sometimes they're not always completely honest, their beliefs about Jesus are actually quite different from ours in the mainstream church. And you know what Jehovah's Witnesses remind me of, particularly, but Mormons to some extent as well, but any of those kind of fundamentalist sects, which sometimes give the church such a bad name. They remind me of somebody who goes to a, a restaurant and who pours over the menu, but they never actually have a meal. Or they remind me of a traveler who's kitted out in all their traveling gear, all their equipment, they're pouring over maps, they're pouring over guides, but they never actually go on any journey. You see, the reason why we take the Bible so seriously in the Christian church is really for one reason alone. The Bible points us to Jesus. And in that respect, the Bible is only the menu, not the meal. The meal is Jesus. Jesus referred to himself in those terms as the meal. And the Bible is only the map. It's not the journey. The journey is Jesus also. And this is the point Jesus is making in our gospel reading. He quotes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61. He's in the synagogue, not in Gatley, but in Nazareth. And he's quoting those, those beautiful and those powerful words from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, release to the, captain, to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Luke tells us, um, he rolls up the scroll and he goes and sits down. And then he says to them, today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, this scripture, this scripture is all about me. Matt Smethurst from the Gospel Coalition writes this. If we ever hope to properly handle the stories in the Bible, we must first grasp the story of the Bible. And that story, the one that traverses its way from Genesis to Revelation, though recorded for you, is not finally about you. The focus is far higher and the hero far better. Given the Bible's astounding diversity, its plot line's fundamental coherence is striking. Across 66 books of various genres, 40 plus authors from a variety of backgrounds and occupations, 1500 plus years of writings, 10 civilizations, three continents, three languages, there is one story. One unified story of redemption and rescue. The Bible has one ultimate plan, one ultimate plot, one ultimate champion, one ultimate king. And that is why the Bible is such a book of encouragement. Because it points us to Jesus like no other source 
It points us to Jesus. It points us to Jesus' background. It points us to the history of his people. It points us to what is to come also uh, in terms of uh, the history of the church. But in so many ways, it points us to Jesus. And the more we get to know the Bible, the more we get to know Jesus. So how might we respond practically on this Bible Sunday? What pledges might we make in our hearts and our lives today in terms of our engagement with the scriptures? Well, attending church on a Sunday is a really good start. We follow the lectionary, like many churches, we follow the common worship lectionary. And the idea of that is that every three years, we are basically taken through the whole of the Bible. And it's a wonderful scheme. I think it works really well. We follow it very, very closely here at St. Wilfrid's, and that's a really, really good start. But we have a, another opportunity here at St. Wilfrid. We have Wednesday evenings. Wednesday evenings, we gather at 7 o'clock always for, for a short Bible study, uh, as well as prayer. And um, we share together, we share together our reflections. Hi, welcome. Hello. Come and join us. <laughs> hi. And um, hi. Yeah, we share our reflections. It's a lovely time of sharing together. And... Um, we actually set out on a huge adventure at the beginning of the year. We started in Genesis, and the plan is to journey through the whole of the Bible on Wednesday evenings. Now, that's going to take quite a few years. So we've done most of Genesis so far. We've done most of Matthew as well, and we're going back into Genesis um, in, a, in a week or so's time. Um, and it'd be lovely to see more people coming on a Wednesday evening. But if you don't come on a Wednesday evening, at least follow the readings. So I, I publish in Concord every month where we're up to on that epic journey. Uh, so do read along with us. And um, let's all join in this wonderful journey of discovery together. But really, ideally, I would say the ideal is that we are reading the Bible every day. And really, there are so many resources out there today. If you are online, on the Church of England website, there is a daily prayer app. And that will take you through the morning prayer and evening prayer readings, which will take you through the Bible in, in two years. There's wonderful podcasts like Pray As You Go, where not only do you get the, the set reading of the day, you get some lovely music, you get some lovely reflection, that's one of my favourites. There's Sacred Space, which is, which is similar, um, but just kind of in written form. Or, and if you're not online, maybe something to consider for yourself, for a Christmas present or for somebody else. There are lots of different versions of what's called the Bible in one year. So for every day of 365 days, there are readings from the Old Testament, the New Testament and a psalm and that will take you through the Bible in one year. There's lots and lots of ways of doing it. And I'm very happy always to talk to anyone about any of those plans. Um, but that's the ideal, that we should be engaging with Scripture every day of our lives. As the collect puts it that we prayed earlier, that we should be reading, learning, marking, inwardly digesting. Because... The scriptures are above all, as Paul reminds us, they're for our encouragement because they introduce us, they point us to Jesus. And boy, do we need some encouragement at the moment. And boy, do the people around us need some encouragement as well. Just to end with another thought, the Bible itself in quite a few places tells us that governments, <laughs> and regimes come and go, some of them quite quickly. But the word of the Lord stands forever. Amen.